Hi, I'm Tom Reed, and I'm standing in front of an archway built during Prohibition. Beyond this doorway was once a casino room. Over here, we have the escape route just in case the coppers showed up. Come with us and we'll find out more about Tommy's Detroit Bar and Grill. We're here at Tommy's Detroit Bar and Grill with the proprietor, Tommy Burrell. It's now Tommy's Bar, but my understanding is it's had some similar names over the years. I believe it was from the 1950s through part of the 1970s, it was called Thomas's Bar. Okay, I didn't know this when I took over. And in the 1930s and 40s, it was called Tom's Tavern. So we've <laughs> gone from Tom's to Thomas's to Tommy's, you know. I guess it was fate, you know, that I should have bought it. Somebody called and said, you got to get down here and meet this lady. Well, apparently, she said that my family owned this a long time ago. And as it comes to find out, her father was Tom. And so when it was Tom's Tavern, she grew up in this place. And uh, she said you know, her parents sold it when she was about 15. Uh, her father had had a heart attack. He did recover, but they felt the stress was, was too much on him at that point. We were approached by Preservation Detroit. People are not familiar with them. They're just an excellent organization, but they, uh, their goal is to not only preserve Detroit's great old edifices, they want to document their history as well. And they spent uh, probably close to a year researching this project before they started. They brought uh, Wayne State University's archaeology department on board, and um, there was an excavation that lasted almost 11 weeks. Based on what we found, there was a standalone wooden structure there until probably the late 1860s. And then um, in the 1880s, the first map of the building was published and it shows a one-story brick structure set back from the street. And then over the next 100 years or so, the building is added onto in all shapes and configurations. A second brick story is added. Uh, the front of the building is built out closer to the street. Um, additions are built onto the back. Uh, and all through this period, there's an outbuilding standing alone um, right where the driveway is today behind the building. Uh, from 1897 to 1973, there was uh, the original Union Depot stood across the street here where Wayne County Community College now sits. So if you had a stopover on your train or you can get off the streetcar, you could walk into this building. You could actually, there was a you know, small section of the building where you could actually get a cocktail real quick. You know. Um, you could get an ice cream soda. There was a cigar manufacturer, which I don't. I believe was nothing more than a guy with a table with a bunch of leaves rolling cigars. Okay. <laughs> okay. And uh, and then um, also you could get you know a quick trim and a shoe shine. This was a really popular passenger train station, not a freight train station. And in fact, um, it was the major departure point for soldiers during World War One. Before they were deployed to war, the soldiers would sleep in the basement of the Fort Presbyterian Church, and then they actually had their own separate entryway into the side of the church facing 3rd Street. So you have to imagine, um, what would you do the days before you were going <laughs> off to war? Um, sure, you'd probably pray a lot and you know take a nice long nap, but you'd probably want to go <laughs> have a good drink too. So you have, to, you have to think about how Tommy's Bar fit into the wider landscape of the neighborhood historically um, over the course of the 19th and 20th century. So the train station was there since 1893. So from that point onwards, this would have been a major first stop or last stop. But we do know that um, around 1920, there was an Italian restaurant that occupied the, um, the main floor here. But um, it's been said, I mean, I, I say it's been documented, you know, a lot of people will dispute it because they're not here to see it, but this place was controlled by the Purple Gang during Prohibition. Now, we'll never know the exact numbers, but estimates say that 75% of all the booze that came into the U.S. illegally crossed the Detroit River. So Detroit is hugely underestimated in the story of Prohibition in the U.S., um, my colleague at Preservation Detroit, Marion Christensen, and Tommy 
uh, once saw a photograph of Al Capone standing outside of Tommy's bar. Al Capone was known to come from Chicago to Detroit to do business with the Purple Gang. You know, he was kind of at their mercy, not the other way around. If anybody has not had the opportunity to see footage of um, what it looked like in those days, and honestly, you know, being a Detroiter my whole life, I don't remember ever Joe Lewis not being there. But uh, there's a movie called Detroit 9000, which anybody could get on Netflix. It's no great accomplishment in cinematography or anything, <laughs> but it's very cool because it does have scenes where there's a police chase that comes around the backside of the building. And um, when you see that, you see there's, and, and prior to that, you can see, you know, part of the movie where they're showing the backside of the train station when it sat there and this building, which looks exactly like it does now, except for it was painted a different color. And when you see the police chase take place, there's no Joe Louis Arena, there's no walkways, no parking structures. All you see is how accessible the water was. And it was, it's pretty cool. Detroiters, maybe Detroiters over a certain age, might remember Little Harry's restaurant. And Little Harry's was a was a grand establishment uh, set on East Jefferson, um, I think in the area of Joseph Campo or Shane um, for years, and it was torn down. Yeah, Anita, Anita Baker bought the Little Harry's and then tore it down in the IHOP is there today. What a shame. It was an old building that was used as a boarding house. What was not known until Wayne State had finished the research that this was the original Little Harry's during Prohibition. Little Harry's, the speakeasy, that was underneath Tommy's bar, uh, we were able to identify its name because the operators of speakeasies gave out business cards with the speakeasy's name on it and its address and its phone number. So first of all, that makes you think, like, well, these weren't really that secret if they had business cards with their address and phone number on them. Probably not. But these business cards are what you would flash to gain access into the speakeasy. And the owner of the building was a guy named Harry Weitzman. And he operated the building and the speakeasy until 1929, 1930. And then he sold it off. And he actually later went on to, own, to open, own, and operate Little Harry's on Jefferson. That didn't exist until after Prohibition. There was a kind of a small building that was a shack that uh, they believe was it housed the blacksmith, and and uh, the original entrance was on that side. But during Prohibition, they have records of this small structure standing there. And um, when they dug, if you look at the south side of the building, and uh, you can see a bricked in, cemented in doorway. When they dug down there, this this was last summer actually, they were able to come across some uh, remnants and intact uh, old liquor bottles. They would bring people through here, they would take, take a step down and they would jog into this tunnel, the tunnel in the front here, okay? Now there is a hidden staircase in the tunnel which was added during Prohibition. They were able to document that. And so you'd come down the staircase. Now inside the front part of our building here was a big speakeasy, a thriving speakeasy. Back in the 1980s, um, came from his father was a plumber and uh, he was in this room on several occasions. Um, and, and, and how this got started, at the head of our stairs in our basement, uh, we have a, um, it's kind of something that sits there that just it made no sense to me. It was a large room filled with dirt. And there's no in, there's no out. And so asking this guy, I said, what do you, what do you know of this? You know, the, 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 the gentleman I had met at the time was, was just, you know, he was in elementary school. But his memory was pretty good. And he said that, uh, you know, you remember the tunnels. And he says, well, he says, if my memory serves me correctly, you know, he says, I know you had a casino room underneath your street. And of course, just floored me. He says, but if you go into your tunnel, if memory serves me correctly, you have a hidden staircase and there's a doorway underneath the staircase. And he says, and that's where I believe the dirt came from. So here comes the stairs down. You come down the stairs and there, there was a false wall there. there. You can see the scar of it built right into the cement, went all the way up to the ceiling, it had wood paneling on it. Um, this wood paneling? Yeah, it had the green wood paneling, so right when you come down the stairs, it had that. So this little room here, during Prohibition, you'd come down, just be a little green room, and then there's this kind of passageway here. Right. Um, that goes to the area that would have been the space. Okay, so, all right, because we had always been under the impression that 
out here under the street. Mm -hmm. that yeah. But you're saying it's really just the west end of the of the basement. I mean, it's possible it could have extended under the street. It doesn't look like it from the soil coring we did. It was a really dense clay. It's not the kind of stuff you would fill in if you were covering up a room really quickly. And interestingly enough, uh, we believe there was a bricked in doorway in one section of the wall and there was a brick where we had removed and you can actually, our goal is to actually do this where we can get a longer camera, something on a wire, but we were able to see inside there. You see a lot of open space and just a bunch of rubble. So until we actually open it up, we don't know what's in there. Wayne State decided that, that they wanted to dig and find out if there was something there. Long story short, what we wound up finding here was um, a giant barrel that was decayed and filled with garbage. Most interesting find was they found a couple of buckets of bones. And uh, they came and got me when they found them. And <laughs> it was pretty interesting. And I'm like, I didn't do it, uh, okay? <laughs> but as it turned out, they were pig bones. Um, and that barrel seemed to be old. It could have been for distilling or something else, but there was no tunnel. There was no architectural structure that remained there, um, so far as we could tell. So we had a big reveal party on the exact date of the 80th anniversary of the repeal of Prohibition. What better time to, to have this party? The party was hosted by Tommy and Preservation Detroit. It was a fundraiser for Preservation Detroit. I and my students and my colleagues at Preservation Detroit and Tommy, we all dressed up in period costume, because you gotta, <laughs> gotta look the part. Flappers and gangsters and Tommy guns were all over the place. A couple of us stayed in the basement for the whole three hours and had different stations. So groups on tour would stop at station one, two, and three and hear a little bit about the story of the building and how we arrived at the conclusions we did about the speakeasy. And then upstairs, they had all sorts of other sorts of entertainment. We had the artifacts laid out from the excavations. We had the students standing around the, the pool table room in the back, kind of giving a show and tell session. We're hoping that um, sooner or later, as maybe the story gets out, there'll be people with some recollection of what went on here. And we have the baseline uh, established. But really, that's just the foundation for future research. Now, we're in a position where we can do a lot more with the building, a lot more with the building's history, both before and after Prohibition, um, as well as during Prohibition. Perhaps we could go and excavate more of the area in the back and look for more traces of activity back there. Were they distilling booze? Was there a tunnel to other buildings, the church or, or the foundry? We're kind of apprehensive about what's going to happen to that building once the sports landscape shifts. And so we'd like to do whatever we can to continue partnering with him to put this building on the National Register of Historic Places, which would then make it eligible for certain rehab funding and research funding. Um, and being so close to campus, having such excellent food, <laughs> being able to go upstairs and you know have a quick drink or uh, listen to some music and access Wi-Fi is really a special treat for archaeologists doing field work. We're off the beaten path, and I think a lot of it, I mean, some of the history has been forgotten about, and it took someone with the determination of Preservation Detroit and Wayne State to really find out. And I still think there's a lot more oh, to, yeah, be, to, to be discovered. Yeah. So I don't plan on going anywhere, and I plan on, you know, we've, we've had some success over here over the last few years, and this has helped, helped kind of put us on the map, too, but... Um, so we're, we're very excited for the future.